The Path is a teaching series sponsored by World Missionary Evangelism. We hope that this series will deepen your knowledge and walk in our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's your host, John Cathcart. In the previous program, we were talking about the little city, it's scarcely a city. I've been there. It's a town, and it's not much of a town either. But the little place where Jesus grew up, Nazareth. And this despised and distant post was the perfect place for the child of Bethlehem to be hidden from the tyrannous, murderous Herods. Besides, if anyone had inquired about the young Jesus, they would have heard about his questionable legitimacy. And no king that the Herods could conceive of or recognize could be such a one. You know, when I visited Nazareth a few years back, we drove through rugged, rocky hills on a winding road that seemed to plummet down toward the town. And whether the old access road that people used to ride up on animals has disappeared in the modern road construction or not, I don't know. I hope it hasn't, but at any rate, I drove in on a road. But at least we do have a description of how Nazareth used to be and the approach used to be. Well, what was the life of Jesus like during the 30 years that he spent in Nazareth. I think every Christian has wondered about that. Well, of the four evangelists, John and Mark pass over those years in absolute silence. If you read Mark, Mark starts with the preaching of John the Baptist. He skips everything else. Matthew gives us one chapter about the visit of the Magi and the flight into Egypt. And then he picks up on the preaching of John the Baptist. It is Luke alone who describes the presentation of the Christ child in the temple when he was about age tw 12. And then we are told in Luke 2 and verse 40, quote, the child grew and waxed strong in the spirit, becoming filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Following that statement, and this is extremely interesting, should be to Bible students, following that statement, that the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, becoming filled with the wisdom and the grace of God was upon him, Luke then tells the story of Jesus in the temple at age 12 and concludes with these words from Luke 2 and 52, quote, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and grew in favor with God and man. The development of Jesus was strictly human development. Jesus did not come into this world endowed with infinite knowledge, but as Luke clearly tells us, he gradually advanced in knowledge. Likewise, Jesus was not possessed of infinite power, but he knew the imperfections, limitations, and weaknesses of human, physical infancy. In other words, Jesus grew up as other children grew up. If he hadn't, he could not be our Savior. Because as Anastasia said, what the Lord has not assumed, he cannot redeem. Well, there's a deep silence in the evangelists about this period in the life of Jesus. 
The evangelists don't try to speak about things of which they had no personal knowledge. They wanted to tell the story of Jesus as they knew it and not to construct a speculative narrative such as been done by some of the writers of other Gospels. And there are other Gospels that have been written. And we are blessed by the fact that the Holy Spirit guided those who selected the canon of Scripture to reject them. Of course, one of these is known as the Shepherd of Hermes. And the th kind of things that are written in the Shepherd of Hermes are the mark of a phony biographer. Christ passed 30 years in the obscurity of a provincial village, being brought up in the most despised province of a conquered land. And for 30 years he tabernacled among us, unknown and unnoticed. And during those 30 years there was no amazing miracle or pronouncement to herald the fact that he was the coming king. Now this is not what the Jews expected, nor could have they imagined it or invented it. And its very fact is a stamp of its authenticity. This is not what anyone would have expected, but it was so. And therefore the evangelists leave this unspectacular early life of Jesus as it was and as it is. And I might say it is doubtful that we will ever know anything about the childhood of Jesus. The evangelists would have told us if they had been, if there had been any orally transmitted stories of significance about his childhood. And the fact that the only remarkable story about the youth of Jesus is, is his appearance in the temple around age 12, and the fact that this story must have come from Mary to Luke directly is a very strong argument that there is no other remarkable incident. If there had been, I believe Mary would have told Luke and he would have told us. Just as it is in America, the key to escaping poverty is education. World Missionary Evangelism has long recognized the importance of education and has emphasized it to the children that we save via our child sponsorship programs and food for hunger programs. We have established schools and these schools provide the basic education these children need to begin to escape the poverty that has ensnared their families, often for generations. What can you do to help us educate children? In many cases, we need new schools. World Missionary Evangelism also needs books and supplies. Children have to have school uniforms in many nations just to attend schools. And of course, there's the need for things like backpacks. How can you get involved? Well, you can call us toll-free at 1-800-501-2851 and find out the various costs of providing a child with things like school supplies, backpacks, a desk, a school uniform, or perhaps even an education at a university or college. Once again, that number is 1-800-501-2851. An education builds a bridge between hopelessness and hope. It provides a future where dreams can be realized. It also positions a child to become a leader as an adult, and in that leadership role, lift his family and his country out of the bonds of poverty. You can begin right now by supporting programs at World Missionary Evangelism that emphasize education. If we go to the Old Testament, the ancient prophecy about the childhood and the youth of Jesus 
is given in Matthew chapter 53 and verse 2. And it says, He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. Now, you know, a tender plant has to be protected and watched over. I know a little bit about this because I've had some pretty big gardens and I still have a little garden where I grow vegetables and a tender plant has to be protected and watched over. And the ground out of this, which this plant, this tender plant grew, Isaiah tells us it's dry ground. In other words, it was spiritually dry ground. And thus, the ground needed to be watered by him with a capital H who was watching over the plant. And God watered the tender plant, the child and young man Christ Jesus, by the dew of his presence in prayer and in communion. Now, there is one question that should not be ignored. Did the child Jesus know who he was? And if not, when did he become aware of who he was? And I think the answer is that Jesus became gradually aware of who he was, just as ordinary children become aware of who and what their parents are and what their position in life is, and I choose to leave this so. But regardless, and as Philippians chapter two and verse seven says, quote, he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And this word made in the Greek, he made himself of no reputation. The word there in the Greek means emptied himself. He emptied himself of reputation, which to me conveys the idea that Jesus was self-effacing. He wasn't pushy. He wasn't drawing attention to himself. He was self-effacing. There are other Gospels than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They have been rejected correctly from the canon of Scripture. But if we look at these Gospels, which are called the Apocryphal Gospels, we see how different the false human ideal is from the divine fact. And these writers, whether orthodox or heretical, surround the boyhood of Jesus with a blaze of miracles that make it unnatural and repulsive. The boy Christ, as presented in the scripture, is simple and obedient and humble. He is subject to his parents until he becomes a weos or a growing man at age 30, which is why he didn't start preaching until he got to age 30. And Jesus was occupied solely with the quiet duties of his home and of his age. He loved all men, and all men loved this pure, gracious, and noble child. Well, Jesus matured like Moses matured in the wilderness, like David matured among the sheepfolds, like Elijah matured among the tents of the Bedouin, like Jeremiah matured in his quiet home at Anathos, and like Amos, the prophet matured among the sycamores of Tekoa, unnoted and unknown until the time of his revealing to Israel. His outward life as a child and a youth 
was like the life of the other children of peasant parents in that very, very quiet little town. Well, what would the home in which Jesus grew up look like? The homes were very plain, with doves sunning themselves on the white roofs. Mats and carpets were loosely laid along the walls. Shoes and sandals were taken off at the threshold. A lamp hung from the center of the dwelling and actually was the only ornament in the room. There would be a wooden chest painted with bright colors which would sit in some recess along the wall and it would contain books and other valued little treasures of the family. There was an easily reached ledge that ran around the walls and on it were neatly stacked quilts, which served as beds. In other words, they took them down and rolled them out. And on the same ledge, there were earthen vessels for daily use. Now, near the door, you remember when Jesus turned the water into wine? Near the door, there were large common water jars of red clay with a few aromatic twigs and green leaves stuffed in the opening at top in order to keep the water cool. Now at mealtime, a painted wooden stool was placed in the center of the room. A large tray was put on it. And in the middle of the tray was a dish of rice or meat or stewed fruits. They all helped themselves from a common plate in the middle of the room. Such was mealtime in the home of Jesus. World Missionary Evangelism, through its wide variety of mission outreach programs, is an evangelical force in developing nations, and it all begins with native missionaries. Called by Christ to do His work, our native missionaries are first and foremost soul winners often facing hostile opposition, they have the courage to reach out in compassion to the lost, sharing the good news with those in their communities. But that is just the beginning of WME's evangelistic programs. World Missionary Evangelism reaches children through vacation Bible schools and Christian schools. So even as we feed the hungry bodies of little ones, we also feed their souls. For almost six decades, WME has been building churches in both urban and rural areas. Most of these churches are used every day of the week and become beacons of light in the areas where they serve. Churches not only provide worship opportunities, but they also offer a community gathering point, education, child care, and even serve as feeding centers for the hungry. WME not only sponsors native missionaries, we train them. World Missionary Evangelism has local pastoral education programs for new missionaries and continuing education programs for those who have been in the field for years. WME also has Bible colleges that provide degree programs for those seeking a fuller knowledge of the Bible and Christian outreach. The evangelism in World Missionary Evangelism is not just a part of our name. It defines our mission, our focus, and is at the heart of everything we do. In the last segment, we described the home in which Jesus lived, and we described mealtime. Very simple life. And none of this agrees with the fantastic paintings of the medieval artists. I mean, the medieval artists painted it the way they saw things, but it was not reality. What we just described was reality. Well, when Joseph returned from Egypt, he knew full well that his family was going into seclusion as well as safety. But don't think that the poverty 
in which they lived was pauperism. There was nothing miserable or ab abject about their lifestyle. It was simple, it was contented, and it was happy. And you know, you see these paintings done by medieval artists of Mary with a halo around her head and, you know, with an abstract, distant look in her eye. Uh, that's not the case at all. Mary, like others of her rank, would spin, cook food, go buy f fruit for the family, and in the evening visit the fountain, which is still called the Virgin's Fountain, and she would have a, an earthen pitcher, which she either carried on her head or on her shoulders. And for his part, Jesus would play and learn and help his parents with their daily tasks and visit the synagogue on Sabbath days. And remember, Jesus attended synagogue, as did the family. Well, Matthew tells us about the settlement of the Holy Family in Nazareth, and he makes a statement in which he says it fulfilled the scripture spoken by the prophets that he shall be called a Nazarene. Now, actually, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Zechariah prophesied about one whose name was the branch. And it is interesting that the village of Nazareth may have derived its name from its abundant foliage. Hebrews attached immense and mystical importance to the resemblance of sounds or the sounds of words. Matthew was a genuine Hebrew, and he would have seen a prophetic significance that we as Westerners don't see, a prophetic significance in Christ's residence in this town because its name recalled the title by which Messiah was addressed in Isaiah and Zechariah. And in the Hebrew, branch and Nazareth are spelt the same. And if Matthew had been trained at all in the views of the rabbis, and I believe he was, he would know that the Midrash, or the method for ex exposition of the scriptures, involved three things. The Peshat, or the literal explanation, they, the deush, or the application, and the sod, or the mystery. And the fact that this threefold significance existed is illustrated by the, the statement of the famous rabbi, Rabbi Akiba. And he said, quote, one thing God spoke, twofold is what I heard. In other words, God said something, that was literal. But I got the application, and I understand the mystery behind it. So there is far more to Matthew's comment than meets the eye. And, and as the famous Dr. Idersham said, Matthew often targums for himself, which means that Matthew's interpretation, or Matthew's translation is an interpreting translation. He's not just translating, he's interpreting what he's saying. Well, the people ask the question, shall Christ come out of Galilee? And the rabbis said to Nicodemus, search and look, for out of Galilee arises no prophet. But the words of the rabbis were either deliberately false or were spoken in ignorance because Barak, the deliverer, 
famous deliverer in the time of the judges, Elon the judge, Anna the prophetess, and three, if not four, of the great prophets of the Old Testament had been born or had exercised their ministry in the precincts of Galilee. And those prophets were Jonah, Elijah, and Nahum. So in spite of the supercilious contempt with which it was regarded, this little town of Nazareth, situated in a healthy and secluded little valley, very close to the confines of great nations, and in the center of an international population. We're talking of Nazareth. This place was eminently fitted to be the home of our Savior's childhood. Now remember that Solomon gave this city to Hiram as a gift? So perhaps Hiram will get a chance to revise his opinion of Solomon's gift personally. I have no doubt that Solomon was, was guided by God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ to give this magnificent prophetic gift to the man who helped build the temple. When many think of world missionary evangelism, they think of us as an organization that provides meals for the hungry. We do that, but in many cases, this is just the beginning. We also provide farm animals for families. Why? Because this allows us to give them something that can help them win the battle of hunger each and every day. A farm animal, such as a chicken, a hog, milk goats, a milk cow or a water buffalo can feed a family by providing eggs, milk, cheese, and other products. They can also serve as a source of income for selling food and offspring at local markets. If you would like to be involved in this life-saving ministry, why don't you call us at 1-800-501-2851.